All right, everyone, I am here with Michael Bronstein. Michael is a professor at Imperial College London and head of graph machine learning at Twitter. Michael, welcome back to the Twimble AI podcast. Thank you, Sam. Always uh, great to be here. Absolutely. It's great to have an opportunity to catch up with you. Um, you joined Twitter uh, about a year ago following the acquisition of Fabula, which you co-founded in April of 2018, if uh, LinkedIn is guiding me correctly, which was just a few months after the last time we spoke, which was uh, in December of 17 at NeurIPS in Long Beach. Uh, so it's been uh, an exciting two, two and a half years for you. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. So I think when we talked, uh, it was together with Joan Bruna, uh -huh. And we were talking after our tutorial that we gave on this topic at Grips, and a lot of things have changed in this field from that date in these two years. It's been really very, very quick and very fast paced. Awesome. Awesome. Well, why don't you um, give us a little bit of an update uh, with what you're, you've been up to, um, your, your role at Twitter and, uh, any changes in, in what you've been up to at, uh, Imperial College London. Sure. So probably since we last met, I think, uh, when, uh, uh, uh at New Rips 2017, when we also presented with Joan, uh, this tutorial, it still was rather a niche or an exotic topic, basically uh, using, uh, uh, neural networks to do deep learning on graphs appear to be something that is quite uh, removed from what uh, the majority of people were doing at that time in machine learning. Nowadays, it's uh, very different in a matter of these two years, uh, graph neural networks have become one of the most prominent topics. And if you look at the statistics of iClear, for example, that happened a couple of months ago, that was one of the most uh, uh, frequent keywords in the papers that, that were submitted. So you really see graph neural networks everywhere at machine learning conferences. This is probably one of the, the, the most frequent, frequent topics. And it is obvious why basically graphs are very generic, abstract mathematical models for systems of relations, interactions. You can model with graphs, uh, systems in practically every field of application from particle physics to social networks to biological sciences uh, and applications from uh, these domains, uh, drug development, uh, 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 neutrino uh, detection, uh, uh, different things that, that we've been doing in, in these domain uh, work on proteins. I, I'll be glad to talk about it. So it's, it's really a very broad, a vast spectrum of applications and problems. And that's why uh, uh, this has become a very prominent topic. What I should say that, uh, there has not been a revolution as uh, probably some of us that, that have been working in this field for a while. Uh, something similar to what happened in computer vision with convolutional neural networks about eight years ago after the, the, the famous uh, AlexNet paper that actually completely revolutionized uh, the field of computer vision. We haven't seen really in the killer app uh, some field where uh, graph neural networks would make uh, such a dramatic impact but it is probably more an evolution, an extremely fast evolution. So in a matter of a few years, uh, basically these methods are everywhere. And uh, I think uh, there are several reasons. Uh, so if you can think of uh, what, what were the key drivers for success of deep learning, uh, these are obviously large data sets that became available in the public domain. Uh, so not only data sets, but also carefully designed benchmarks that include data and tasks and the way of evaluating them. ImageNet is uh, the great example. Uh, then computing power, and in this case, it was uh, GPUs, and also software so with uh, uh, software libraries such as uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow, you can very easily uh, implement and prototype uh, deep learning systems. So similar things uh, started happening uh, in uh, the domain of graph learning as well. So now we have the open graph benchmark that was announced just uh, 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 less than a year ago, in the end of 2019. There are several uh, libraries that are professionally implemented and maintained, like the, the Deep Graph Library or PyTorch Geometric. The hardware is still uh, the good old GPUs. You can argue whether they're well suitable for uh, dealing with graphs, but uh, uh, at least uh, they, they, do, they do the job. 
So basically, we have this uh, magic confluence of of all the factors that made deep learning successful and uh, that promise to make deep learning on graphs uh, successful as well. Uh, in terms of uh, basically, what are the, the 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 key challenges that we still need to overcome? One of them is scalability. Basically, so far most of the research really focused on small graphs. So small graphs like citation networks with maybe maximum five or ten thousand nodes. This is not what you really see in practice. So if you look at the graphs that we need to do at Twitter, they have hundreds of millions of nodes, multiple billions of edges. So this is the really gap of orders of magnitude. And until I would say very recently, and with exception of a few research groups, these uh, topics have not been addressed in the in the academic uh, community. So we only now start seeing methods that are developed for dealing with large scale graphs and being evaluated, what is probably more important, on large scale uh, data sets. And the open uh, uh, graph benchmark tries to uh, to bridge this gap. So uh, basically, it's only the uh, only the beginning of seeing these uh, 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 these methods used uh, uh, in settings that are close to to, uh, to real life applications in industrial settings. I'm aware of uh, a few uh, settings where these systems are already used in production. Some of them are confidential information, so I cannot uh, I cannot disclose the, the the details. But there are several companies that are already using graph neural networks in their uh, production systems. So it starts to become uh, real industrial systems. Uh, and is it uh, the several companies that you're thinking of? Is it um, you know that there are a few companies that are operating at the the scale that you suggested, or uh, is it that in general, um, graph neural networks, you know, we're just starting to, you know, get to that kind of edge of production deployment? Well, so uh, two companies I asked that, that I, I asked that in part because yeah. I hear about it all the time, a lot of conversations about it. I get the impression that it's being used, um, you know, more regularly by folks. Um, but you're saying that, you know, you only know of a few. Well, at least a few officially. So there, of course, they are used, uh, whether it's used in production system or whether it's used uh, uh, for research. So uh, Pinterest was probably one of the pioneers. So they used uh, used it uh, uh, probably already a couple of years ago. Alibaba uh, uh, last year published uh, a paper where they showed that they use graph neural networks uh, in some of their business applications. So there, there are a few examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I. In, in thinking about the, the killer app for this and the, um, some of the points you made about scale, I you know, wonder if part of the issue is that you know, the killer app is you know, social networks and we only have a few of those. You know, we're not, not every company is out there starting their own social network. Do you think that, um, that social networks are kind of uh, u uniquely positioned to use graphs or are they you know, is graph neural networks, you know, just as strong a tool for some of the, the non kind of obviously graphical uh, types of use cases like we see in healthcare and, um, you know, you mentioned physics and medicine and other things. Yeah, absolutely. So to, to start with the first part, obviously social networks like Twitter, maybe Facebook and Google uh, are uh, the, the first candidates that come into mind. This is probably also, the very obvious uh, graph structured data that that is uh, that is produced by by people using these platforms, uh, but there are many other things. Recommender systems. So let's say a company like Amazon, for example. Uh, so uh, they are not a social network, but they have a lot of graph structured data about how people interact with their products. Uh, they have recommender systems. Uh, the, uh, companies like Netflix, for example, as well, or with their classical already Netflix challenge, uh, one of the typical examples of, of recommender system. So there are many more than, than just the obvious uh, two or three companies that, that would come to your mind when talking about graph structured data. Now, uh, beyond this, uh, there are many other um, applications where graph structured data is a very natural way of describing the, the, the data that is generated in these applications or collected in these applications. So you mentioned healthcare. Uh, uh, basically, the way that we can think of our body, basically, it's uh, an interaction graph between uh, a lot of biomolecules, whether it's proteins, whether it's drugs, whether it's metabolites. So it's uh, and recent research shows that that's uh, there is a lot of benefit of 
thinking of it in this way. So these are very complex systems. It's probably a hugely simplified way of thinking of them as a static graph. It's probably a dynamic system. There is a lot of uh, uh, factors and degrees of freedom that we are probably still unable to account for. But the bottom line of this is uh, there, there has been a lot of in very interesting progress uh, that uh, comes from modeling biological systems uh, uh, in healthcare applications uh, from the, the position of graphs. I would mention just one of them. So there was uh, earlier this year a paper in Cell, which is a top uh, biological journal, a group from uh, MIT that, that uh, showed uh, a new class of antibiotics that was virtually screened using uh, graph neural networks. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, one of the things that I noticed in the way you talk about graph neural networks today, and maybe this has evolved over the past couple of years, but to your point, you talk about it as being applicable to non-Euclidean structured data uh, today, as opposed to what I remember, you know, from you or perhaps from others, you know, being more focused on graph structured data. So there's kind of, you know, obvious applications of it. Uh, in the case of social networks and other things, but uh, it sounds like now you're you know, seeing and going for you know people to understand the broader applicability of um, these types of uh, of a graphical formulation, you know, beyond the things that are obviously um, you know naturally structured as graphs. Right. So, uh, well, we, we do like to think of it as uh, non-Euclidean unstructured data, basically, as opposed to, let's say, grid-like data, as you see in images or in audio or in text. Uh, so graphs are probably the most generic models for that, but there are many other applications. So manifolds, for example, we actually started my own research. Start, we started with using uh, deep learning on uh, geometric objects, on meshes, on manifolds, and then, then we moved to, to more general graphs. Uh, uh, but these methods are, if, if, if you're if talking about uh, other types of data that uh, that is uh, maybe slightly different from graphs, in computer graphics, in the computer vision community, uh, there is a lot of work nowadays of using deep learning on, on meshes, on basically discrete representations of three-dimensional shapes. It's actually a little bit ironic that computer vision uh, has always said that, you know, 3D data, it's computer graphics. If you're working on this, so you're, you're not from our community, you're from the Seagraph <laughs> community. But, but nowadays, actually, if you look at the best paper awards or the candidates for, for best paper awards, uh, probably half of them are uh, somehow related to 3D geometry. So it's, it, it's, it's interesting how fields evolve. Uh, so bottom line, uh, uh, a lot of interesting applications uh, in computer vision as well in computer graphics uh, that involve geometric uh, deep learning. Mm. Uh, so maybe um, talk a little bit about the the focus of your research uh, at the next level of detail at uh, at Twitter and the university. Um, are you, you know, wh what have you been focused on to push the the research forward? Yeah. So frankly, uh, I'm working on a lot of things. Uh, I would say the, <laughs> I've the major that. focus. <laughs> The, the, the major focus is uh, uh, genetic deep learning graphs, uh, uh, manifolds, and non-Euclidean structured data, as, as, as you said. So uh, let me start with Twitter. Basically, we are working on uh, um, deep learning on graphs. Basically, we are, are, my ambition, at least, is to, uh, to make this technology uh, broadly applicable to many problems that, that uh, we need to address uh, using machine learning systems at Twitter. Uh, so Twitter, uh, basically one of the core data sets and data, uh, data assets at Twitter uh, is graph structured data. And it comes in a lot of different forms, whether it's follow graphs or whether it's uh, uh, different interactions, engagements of users with, with content, with tweets, like tweeting, retweeting, and so on. Uh, also some other graphs that are not exposed to the public that uh, allow, for example, to detect uh, platform manipulation or, or abuse. So uh, basically we, we we are trying to develop uh, methods, uh, uh, graph uh, deep learning methods that would be able to, to take uh, better advantage of this, uh, of this kind of information. And there are several challenges. As, as I mentioned, one of them is scalability. Basically, we're dealing with uh, very large uh, data sets. 
so we need to, develop, to make sure that these methods uh, scale to these uh, to, uh, to, to these kind of data sets, which obviously automatically rules out some of the methods that exist in the literature that, that are even not designed to work with, uh, with these scales. Uh, latency, uh, efficiency, and so on. Another aspect that, uh, uh, that is typical of social networks in theater in particular, that our graphs are dynamic. So it's not really a static graph uh, that, that like I know, a biological network, the way that proteins interact with each other. Basically, it is changing every time, every second. And uh, it's actually a, a graph that is uh, basically in a synchronous stream of events. Basically, every interaction or a user joining the platform or using, uh, following some, somebody, a user uh, uh, tweeting, uh, basically, it's a graph where edges or nodes are created or deleted uh, uh, at some asynchronous time points. So being able to deal with, uh, with uh, dynamic graphs is extremely important. There are some other aspects of, uh, that are probably more on the theoretical research side, uh, but still very important, basically understanding how these uh, systems work. Because if you want to, to, uh, to develop a system that eventually will be serving the public, uh, you need to at least understand better to, to make sure that, uh, uh, that there are no vulnerabilities, that it, it cannot be misused or manipulated. So, for example, understanding how powerful graph neural networks are, whether they can be uh, uh, attacked in an adversarial way, as, for example, as you know, convolutional neural networks are, uh, can, uh, are pretty sensitive to, to adversarial perturbations, to adversarial noise. So there are some works that show that you can change a single pixel in an image and it will be misclassified by a convolutional neural network. So there have been several works recently uh, in the domain of graph learning that show that basically you can do similar things for graphs. And uh, there are several works uh, in that domain, basically on adversarial attacks on graph neural networks that actually show that you can provide certain uh, robustness, theoretical guarantees of uh, how graph neural networks uh, uh, can be can defend against such attacks. Interesting. And is, is this work that you and your team have worked on or are others in the field? So adversarial noise, the pioneering works in this domain were from the group of Stefan Gunemann at the Technical University of Munich. Basically, they started all this uh, trend of uh, adversarial attacks on graph neural networks. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, with regard to the uh, this dynamic nature of uh, graphs, you published a paper uh, just recently on temporal graph networks. Uh, talk a little bit about that formulation and what you're trying to do in that paper. Right. So basically, we, what we presented is a very general framework that allows us to do uh, uh, deep learning on uh, continuous time dynamic graphs. So basically, graphs that can be considered exactly, as I said before, is the stream of events, uh, it's whether pairwise events, uh, basically edges uh, uh, between nodes or events that affect the nodes. So Twitter graph is a, is a good example of, uh, of such a situation. And um, basically it's, uh, it's a framework that generalizes uh, the standard static graph neural networks, but also some previous approaches that were developed for continuous uh, time graphs. I should say that we are obviously not the first to, to, to deal with these problems, but most of the works consider graphs that are just given as snapshots. So you just see a few pictures of the same graph. Basically, this is discrete time graphs, which is a quite disadvantageous model if we, if we were to apply it for uh, graphs that change continuously, like, like the graph in Twitter. So the key element uh, there, basically, there are several key elements. One of them, we, uh, we have a way of using memory. Basically, we attach to each node uh, a state that uh, allows us to compress basically the history of uh, uh, the interaction of this node, uh, this node and the event that happened to this node. Uh, basically, we uh, update this memory from, uh, uh, from the neighbors, from the graph. And then we can do node embeddings that represent uh, the graph at a particular point of time. So we can, for example, solve tasks like doing uh, predictions about the node at certain time. So we can say, for example, whether this user is uh, a bad actor in, in the network and should be banned, for example, or we can uh, predict future links. So I know that from my past interactions with uh, either other users or maybe some content, uh, I can predict what kind of content I might engage with in the future. So that's basically a bread and butter of pre commenter systems, mm -hmm. uh, link, uh, link prediction. And are you and, holding... Uh, 
Are you holding the nodes constant and uh, assuming the edges are dynamic or is it all dynamic? So it's all dynamic. So we didn't consider for simplicity uh, node and edge deletions, but uh, basically the model allows uh, new nodes to be added, nodes to be updated and uh, new uh, edges to be created within nodes as well. So technically speaking, we are looking at, uh, at an object that is a hypergraph or, uh, or a multigraph that, that uh, basically where there are multiple edges between. Uh, between a pair of nodes. Mm -hmm. And you you mentioned the um, kind of the memory that you've got uh, associated with each node and kind of this dynamic accounting is the idea that, uh, I think you also mentioned continuous. It sounds like the idea is that you can have the system, um, you know, running and, and following a stream of, um, you know, additions of nodes and edges and making predictions or updating itself and, and being able to make predictions on the new things that are added as well as the existing things. Is that the general idea? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's, that's exactly the idea. Basically, it's a system that, that is always uh, keeping up to date based on the stream of events that is happening to, to, to this graph. I should also say that one of the key findings in the paper is uh, that uh, training strategy is extremely important. So what we show is is uh, um, a more advanced training strategy that, that allows to, to do the correct patching and, and, and train the neural network uh, in a way that, that is uh, significantly better than, 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 than with uh, previous uh, simpler approaches. Can you give us a, an overview of traditional training for these kinds of networks and then uh, some of the things that you needed to do to uh, make it work in this temporal setting? Well, probably that will be a little bit uh, too many technical details, uh, but basically it has to do with the way that you uh, that, that you do the uh, that you that you create the batches in uh, uh, in, in the training. Basically, there are, there are dependencies between between the nodes that, that you need to uh, to handle uh, efficiently. Okay. Um, awesome. And then. Um... One of the other things that I've seen pop up in your research quite a bit recently is talking about expressivity and expressive power of uh, graphs. What's that line of work uh, focused on? Right, so this is a very important topic. Basically, even the very understanding of uh, uh, how and when graph neural networks work well is still uh, lacking to, to a large extent. So what you see in, experiment, in experiments, for example, that in some settings, uh, graph neural networks work uh, very well, and in some other uh, settings, they are more or less as, uh, as some simple baseline. So the question is, uh, what makes them work? And probably more importantly, what makes them fail? And uh, this is not a trivial question, even formulating it. Uh, basically, what do you mean by expressive power of a graph neural network? Because here, you're not considering it, it just uh, the function approximation capability, like in the traditional setting, where you have a fixed domain and you just your neural network essentially is, represents some class of functions, and we know that even very simple neural networks are universal approximators. They can approximate any function to any desired accuracy, or let's say any continuous function to any desired accuracy. Here, uh, you need to talk about both the domain, so the graph itself, and the function on the graph. So. Uh, uh, there has been a line of works recently, uh, uh, starting from uh, works from the group of uh, 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 Leskowitz at Stanford and, and Hamilton uh, uh, in Canada. Basically, they drew parallels between uh, graph neural networks and uh, what is called the, the Weisfeller Lemon uh, graph isomorphism test, which is a classical construction from uh, graph theory. Basically, it's a heuristic that tests whether two graphs are isomorphic whether they are the same up to permutation of nodes, the topologically equivalent. And essentially, the, one of the simplest versions of this algorithm, it's a graph color refinement. So you color the nodes of the graph, basically you uh, attach some uh, discrete uh, label to the nodes, and then you look at the neighbors and uh, basically color based on the, uh, on the unique structure of the neighborhood. So it is, technically speaking, it's represented as a multi-set, a set where the, the same element can be repeated multiple times. I should say for historical context, that's not the first time that the, the, the vice federal lemon construction was used in, uh, uh, in machine learning. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, the, the group from MPI was, uh, uh, they, they used um, the, the WL test for 
uh, uh, for constructing graph kernels. But let's say they, they, in the context of uh, deep learning on graphs, uh, that's about a year ago, the, the first results were published. And basically what was shown that uh, standard graph neural networks, basically message passing neural networks where uh, the, the learning, uh, the, the network, what the network does essentially it, uh, exchanges information uh, uh, between adjacent nodes along edges. Uh, they are uh, in the best case as powerful as the, the WL test, the weiss feller lemon test. And uh, it is quite uh, interesting result. So first of all, it's important, it gives you a clear idea when such networks work and when they fa fail, at least on some class of problems such as graph classification. And second, it's quite disappointing because it is known that a vice versa lemon test uh, fails on even very simple cases. So uh, when I say fails, meaning that there might be uh, two non-isomorphic graphs that uh, will produce the same coloring. So the, the vice versa uh, lemon test is a necessary but insufficient condition. It says that uh, these graphs might be isomorphic, but uh, we cannot tell for sure. It tells you for sure that they are not isomorphic if the coloring is different. But if the coloring is the same, they might be isomorphic. And one of the, for example, one of the structures that the, the WL test cannot detect is triangles. So just a simple, very simple, straightforward triangle, a triangular motif that uh, might exist in a graph cannot be detected by, by, by graph neural networks. And this is very disappointing because triangles are extremely important patterns in social networks, in biological networks. So if you look at uh, works in bioinformatics and complex systems, uh, they use uh, uh, subgraph structures, motifs all the time. And triangles appear to be very important uh, in, in many applications. So uh, basically there, there, there have been follow-up works. Uh, uh, the WL test, it's actually not a single test, it's a hierarchy of tests. So there is a hierarchy of Weisferrer lemon tests that of higher, uh, higher order where instead of considering uh, just uh, uh, just single uh, color refinement for single nodes, you can look at, uh, at, at uh, tuples of nodes. So you can look at uh, basically at K nodes at the same time. So obviously the complexity of such tests is significantly higher. And uh, there, there were works uh, uh, in particular from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, the group of uh, Jaron Lippmann at the Weizmann Institute in Israel. Um, Kagai Moron he was his PhD student. He is now at uh, I think at NVIDIA, and I was uh, uh, a member of his PhD uh, exam committee. So they show higher order graph neural networks, uh, which are equivalent to KWL test. The problem with these methods is that uh, their, uh, their memory and uh, computational complexity is very high. So let's say going beyond the three WL tests uh, makes uh, no sense. Even that complexity is quadratic, which means that if you have a graph uh, of let's say even modest size of, let's say with 1 million nodes, uh, the complexity will be uh, probably prohibitive for any practical application. Uh, so basically what, what we try to do is we try to go beyond the, the, the vice versa lemon uh, hierarchy. We wanted to, uh, to see if we can basically help the message passing neural network by explicitly encoding the structure around the node in the form of some structural descriptor. And the simplest way to do it is to count uh, graph substructions, whether it's clicks, whether it's cycles, whether it's paths. So that was the paper that, that you mentioned uh, that was done with my PhD student at Imperial College, uh, Georgos Buritsas, and a colleague from Twitter, Fabrizio Frasca. So basically, we, uh, uh, what we did is very similar philosophically to uh, positional encoding. So for each node, uh, we can provide this extra bit of information that, that allows you to do different uh, convolutional like operation or a different message passing dependent on how this node uh, node looks like basically whether it's part of a certain uh, uh, certain uh, structure and uh, this conveys the the, the, the the graph neural network significant uh, more expressivity so for example we can show that if you use uh, even very simple structures like four clicks basically uh, fully connected graphs with uh, four nodes uh, you can uh, be at least uh, not less power than three WL tests or the equivalent uh, higher order graph neural networks. I'm saying that it is not less powerful than than three uh, WL tests because we can find counterexamples. We can find a special family of graphs that are called the strongly regular graphs, where uh, our network that we call the graph substructure network uh, works, and the three WL uh, test fails. Now we couldn't find uh, 
examples to the country where our uh, our network fails and the 3WL test succeeds. It doesn't mean that they don't exist. But I should say that the GSN, the graph substructure network, it's also it's it's a class of networks. Basically, it depends on what kind of structures you use. Uh, uh, you will get different results. You can uh, get different expressivity. What we see so is that you, with a strong, yeah. Uh, Sorry, when you when you talk about um, these these substructures and uh, achieving a certain level of expressivity, is the idea that you are um, constraining the network in some way to these substructures, and, and that's what gives you the expressivity, or that you're uh, identifying the substructures and kind of noting that uh, as a property of the node, and that allows you to determine its expressivity. Right. So it's the later. So basically, we it's a standard message passing architecture. So it has linear complexity, like standard message passing graph neural networks. It uh, receives an extra bit of information, which is a local descriptor that is given for each node, or we also have a version where it's given per edge instead of a node, that are pre-computed. So the pre-computation, the, the, the counting of substructures, it of course, depends on the substructure that you're counting. It might have higher complexity. The, for, for some simple substructures, it's actually, uh, there are uh, computationally efficient methods, but you do it only once. You do it as pre-computation, then the training and the inference has linear complexity, mm -hmm. which is uh, obviously a very appealing property. Basically, you're as efficient as standard graph neural network, it has exactly the same architecture as standard graph neural network with the addition of these, uh, uh, of these structural descriptors. Mm -hmm. So the, on the theoretical side, uh, there are many, uh, uh, I would say, uh, exciting questions because uh, at least to my knowledge, there are no results in graph theory that, 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 that tell. So what, basically what we conjecture is that there exist uh, small structures in the sense that they're order of one, they're independent on the size of the graph, that allow the, the, the graph neural networks uh, basically to, to, uh, to disambiguate uh, uh, large graphs. So basically, they are, would be probably more powerful than, than, uh, than, uh, uh, than KWL tests with very large Ks. Now, uh, the results are pretty, uh, uh, pretty scarce. So there is what is called the graph reconstruction conjecture. It tells you that you can reconstruct the connectivity of the graph uh, from substructures that contain uh, the same graph with a uh, single node removed. But this is obviously not very interesting because the size of these substructures as the graph itself. So the question is whether we can do it with small structures is still an open question. You can probably find uh, some uh, very pathological examples where it fails, but probably with very high probability, you can, uh, uh, you can say that with uh, small substructures, you can be extremely, ex extremely expressive. And uh, um, that, that's basically, that's what we conjecture. That's what we see in experiments. You can also see that uh, it's, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, maybe taking a step back, you, you talked about this uh, WL heuristic as being a, a hierarchical set of tests. Um, but the tests, as I understand uh, them are relating to um, you know, working or not working or uh, isomorphic or not isomorphic, you know, wh where does the hierarchy, how does the hierarchy relate to these more binary classifications of the, the graph as a whole? Right. So, well, this is obviously the premise of the entire problem, right? Whether uh, the graph isomorphism, whether the, the, the fact that two graphs are isomorphic is what you want uh, uh, in terms of describing the, uh, uh, the, the expressivity of your graph neural network. It's obviously a simplification because uh, we might want to look at uh, 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 from a different perspective that what we actually want from our graph neural network. But this is a very simple formulation that is very well studied in graph theory. And uh, basically uh, here, the, the expressive power is whether you are able to tell that two graphs are uh, isomorphic or not. And that's exactly what the hierarchy of KWL test does. Basically the subsequent test K plus one WL is uh, strictly more powerful than KWL, basically, because there are graphs that on which it succeeds and the KWL uh, uh, fails. So, okay, so uh, you've got successively more uh, complex tests, but each one gives you a greater degree of certainty that the graphs are isomorphic. Exactly. Exactly. Got it. So basically, it applies, it succeeds on the bigger family of graphs. Okay. Now, I should say that this is probably not the right way of approaching the problem of graph expressivity. It's very cool and it allowed to establish interesting bridges between 
uh, let's say classical theoretical computer science and graph theory and uh, the field of deep learning but what we probably in real applications we don't really care about uh, exactly isomorphic graphs because it uh, seldom happens if you so so if you think even historically the, the wl tests were developed for uh, uh, applications in in chemistry where uh, chemists wanted to see if two molecules are uh, the same or not now in many cases they are not exactly the same but they are almost the same so you what you're really interested in is some kind of graph distance graph edit distance or maybe chrome of house of distance that allows you uh, to compare to basically gives you a number that tells you how similar two graphs are so the graph isomorphism test is a binary thing it tells you they are isomorphic they are equivalent or they are not but what we are probably more interested in is when they are not isomorphic how much non isomorphic they are mm -hmm. and this is this a setting that is not might... covered that if we had that that might be something we could incorporate into a loss function or um uh for example during training exactly and basically this is this is also interesting because we can say uh uh whether graph neural networks uh, in principle can distinguish between isomorphic non-isomorphic graphs but we don't know how the, how this extends can you say for example that if the graphs uh have a distance of i don't know epsilon between them right uh whether the distance between the embeddings that will be constructed by such uh, uh, such a graph neural networks will be any close to this epsilon so this is actually a, a different kind of uh, uh, branch of mathematics where these problems are uh, uh, are uh, dealt with and this is called metric geometry so basically you're trying to approximate some ground truth distance between the graphs using let's say euclidean distance between the graph embeddings and you want this uh, the new distance between graph embeddings to be as close as possible to the original ground truth distance. So uh, in ideal world, which is obviously a wishful thinking, you would like this to be an isometric embedding, basically an embedding that preserves distance or at least some approximation of it. So it can be, there are many ways or many forms you can make this approximation. You can say that it's, for example, that it uh, scales the distances by uh, by a certain factor, by the by Lipschitz constant of this embedding. You can add some noise. You can say that I can allow uh, uh, epsilon distortion. The, the distance can be a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller. You can also write it as uh, in the probabilistic setting as uh, something that holds with sufficiently high probability, what is called probably approximately correct. So I, I believe that that is probably the direction where we need to go next uh, in this field of uh, uh, trying to, to express the, the power of graph neural networks. And, and just to be clear on that, is it coming up with uh, any formulation for the distance between two graphs or coming up with uh, a good formulation that is able to be expressed as an embedding space and has these properties? Right, so it, it, obviously the results will depend on the distance you use. So some distances uh, might be easier to uh, embed in Euclidean space, some distances might be harder. So uh, I think you would probably choose a distance that makes sense in, in your application, some distance between graphs. The graph isomorphism will be a particular case. Basically, that will be the case when the distance equals zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we do have, there are uh, kind of current ways that we uh, can express the distance between uh, different graphs. And the, it sounds like the issue is, um, again, how well they work in this embedding sense. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and and talking about the the WL test, you mentioned the idea of convolutions of uh, on the graph. What does that mean? How does that convolution that we kind of typically think of as something that's happening in a two D space like an image? How does that translate to a graph world? So, uh, well, there are several ways of thinking of it. You can think of it uh, from the spectral perspective, and I think. Uh, uh, Two and a half years ago, and when we last uh, uh, time talked, we I think we mostly talked about uh, this interpretation. So think of convolution as a kind of shared weights. So if you think of a, a neural network that takes a, a vector input into a vector output, uh, it can be fully connected. So basically, uh, the one output dimension is combined with uh, it's a linear combination of all the input dimensions, right? So if you think of it as a matrix, it will be just full matrix with uh, n squared parameters. Uh, you can think of it as a sparsely connected network. So let's say one output neuron is connected to, let's say, three input neurons. So the sparse matrix, it will have a linear order of degrees of freedom. In convolutional neural networks, all the parameters are shared. 
So the weights that you use to combine, let's say, these three inputs to, get, to form a single output, they are used for all the output neurons. And in this case, you get a very special weight matrix that has a circle structure or a toplet structure. So that's exactly the convolution operator. And uh, from the spectral perspective, this operator uh, commutes with shift. That's what we call uh, shift equivariance. Actually, most people call it shift invariance, but the right mathematical term is shift equivariance. Uh, you can first shift your signal and then apply convolution, and it will be identical to first convolving and then shifting. So uh, um, co commuting matrices uh, are jointly diagonalized. So every convolution uh, is diagonalized by the eigenvectors of the shift operator, which happens to be the Fourier transform in the, uh, in the Euclidean case on the grid. And that's exactly uh, why you can formulate uh, convolutions on graphs using this analogy. So you will use some analogy of the shift operator or the Laplacian operator or basically any local diffusion operator uh, as uh, the analogy of the Fourier basis. And you can do filters in, in that space. Now, a different perspective, the spatial perspective, it's basically this perspective of weight sharing. So basically what you have is you have a node and you have its neighbors, right? On the grid, you can number these uh, neighbors in a canonical order. I can say uh, in an image, I have a neighbor, uh, 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 my top neighbor, my bottom neighbor, my neighbor to the left and neighbor to the right. On the graph, you usually, uh, unless you provide some extra information, you don't have uh, canonical ordering of your neighbors. So the way of aggregating information from the neighbors must be permutation invariant. That's why the aggregators that are used in graph neural networks are permutation invariant functions, whether it's uh, average, whether it's sum, whether it's maximum, uh, they are all permutation invariant uh, functions. Now, the way that you combine the, basically the, the, uh, the information from your neighbors uh, can also be uh, something that is, uh, that is learned, and that's exactly the message passing. So each node in your graph receives uh, a message from your neighbor that depends on the, uh, on the feature vector in that, uh, in that neighbor and the feature vector at the node. And they're aggregated by this permutation invariant function. That is again usually a sum or or a maximum, and the same uh, the same mechanism is used at every node. So uh, you see now how it's similar to convolution that it uses exactly the same parameters at each position in the graph. What is different from images is that the number of neighbors can be very different, but the way you aggregate them is actually completely agnostic to the structure of the graph. Mm -hmm. That's why if you think of the the of the structural descriptors, basically we add extra information that tells you uh, what this uh, what this position in the graph looks like. Got it. Uh, and you recently published a paper on differential graph modules for uh, these graph convolutional networks. How does that fit into into this? Yeah. So this is interesting. So I would say this is a little bit different direction. And um, in most uh, works on graph neural networks, you assume that the graph is given like the Twitter or the Facebook, right? So basically you, you already have the graph. You have some information on the nodes. Let's now use this information, combine the information from the nodes to, to do something with this graph. Let's say to classify the nodes or classify the entire graph. In many applications, you don't know the graph. The graph can be actually used to model the structure of your data. And in some cases, the graph itself can be more valuable than the downstream task. So imagine that you have, uh, for example, uh, some high dimensional point cloud where each point represents a patient. Let's say some features from healthcare uh, data records. And what I want to do is uh, to use the graph to represent some similarities between these patients. So when, uh, for example, when I see your healthcare record and my healthcare record, probably the doctors will look at them differently depending on, uh, on different uh, uh, metadata. For example, if I'm a male or if I'm a female, if I'm old or if I'm young. What is my maybe some uh, uh, genetic variations, or maybe what what is my disease history, and so on? Mm -hmm. So the way that they will treat every node uh, will be different, and that's why the graph can be used to model the data structure. Another probably more typical application from machine learning and let's say computer vision is uh, uh, few shot learning, when uh, you have just a few labeled examples, but you have your data space. So if you can construct some representation of uh, geometric representation of your data space that in the simplest uh, form can be represented as a graph. I can tell that, for example, that these two nearby nodes are similar somehow. So basically I can 
I can uh, learn uh, the structure of this uh, of this data space. So these methods, uh, manifold learning or nonlinear dimensionality reduction, have been around for at least 20 years, maybe even more. So basically methods that try to model the structure of some high dimensional space and then represent it in the lower dimensional space. So algorithms like isomet, for example. Uh, so one of the classical uh, examples is you look at uh, images, let's say images of digits from the MNIST data set. So these images can be extremely high dimensional, right? So it's thousand dimensional, for example, for these digits. But uh, if you look at the uh, at the points that, that these images form in this thousand dimensional space, the intrinsic dimensionality of uh, uh, of these data set is much lower. So uh, manifold uh, uh, manifold learning uh, algorithms try to uh, capture this intrinsic dimensionality of the data set. Now imagine the same thing combined with graph learning. So we want to build a graph that captures the structure of the of this data set and then learn basically uh, something similar to convolution or diffusion operation on this uh, on this graph and basically what, what in this paper what we show is uh, a way of uh, uh, basically an efficient construction where uh, where the graph is constructed on the fly so we build both the graph and the filters that are applied on this graph and we show that this way we can significantly outperform existing algorithms for uh, different uh, healthcare applications, uh, automatic diagnosis, for example, when we want to classify uh, patients. And uh, this has been done already before us, uh, uh, actually by colleagues from uh, from Imperial College, uh, the group of Daniel Ruckert. And uh, um, uh, basically they use some handcrafted construction of the graph. Here we, we don't know a priori which features are useful to build the graph because it also depends on the downstream task. So the graph is constructed in an optimal way uh, for the downstream task. Uh, in, in this work, are you, is it, uh, you mentioned some of the, the work that's um, the, the way that manifolds play into um, kind of compressing down the, the space. Are you trying to, to uh, or is it inspired by um, some of the ways that manifolds are applied in, uh, in, neural networks or is it um, independent of, of that work? Not really. So manifold is probably not an appropriate term, at least uh, from the pure uh, differential geometric standpoint. Basically, this low dimensional space or this low dimensional structure, uh, which represents uh, the data in this high dimensional embedding space, it's technically speaking, it's not a manifold. It might have different dimensionality at different points, uh, but it's uh, a convenient uh, uh, mathematical model to think of it uh, to think of it as a manifold, plus maybe some noise around it. So manifold learning is uh, is exactly this kind of construction that the assumption that there is an underlying low dimensional space that has no nuclear structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, awesome. Well, yeah, we're things have evolved quite a bit over the past uh, two and a half years. If we talk again in two and a half years, what do you think, uh, you know, looking into your crystal ball, how do you think this will all evolve? What are we, you know, maybe on the, the verge of, in your opinion, um, or, you know, what are you most excited about? Well, I think, so let me try to make, I don't know, probably making predictions is, uh, is very uh, ingrateful and dangerous <laughs> business. <laughs> Uh, uh, but still, let's say what uh, would make me happy uh, as uh, somebody working in field, basically, obviously wishing it to be successful. So first of all, industrial applications, uh, basically graph neural networks being standard uh, tool used uh, uh, by, by companies like nowadays uh, deep learning, uh, deep neural networks are used. So graph, deep graph neural networks uh, uh, being used as, uh, uh, in industrial settings. Uh, second, killer apps. And uh, if you if you ask me about what I would bet on as a single application, I think there will be multiple applications. Social networks are obviously one. But what would probably be the most remarkable revolutionary field is uh, probably healthcare and biological sciences. And this is probably something where we should be looking at uh, groundbreaking results in the next five to ten years if everything works uh, as as expected. And again, might be sooner. It might actually never come. And um, basically, there are two levels or two ways of looking at it. So first of all, uh, modeling uh, the uh, molecules themselves as graphs is uh, extremely powerful and extremely promising. 
basically you can predict properties of molecules using graph neural networks. Now, where, where this is important, uh, if you think of the problem of uh, drug discovery and drug development, basically this is extremely expensive and extremely long process. It takes a couple of billion dollars and about 10 years to bring a new drug on the market. Now, why it is so so expensive and so uh, and so difficult? If you look at the search space, it is uh, humongously large. I think estimates are right, but we we have about 10 to the 60 at least uh, synthesizable uh, medium-sized molecules. So you need to choose your candidate drug out of this humongous number. It's more than the number of atoms in the universe. Mm. So you obviously need somehow to restrict this space. So there is uh, that number of molecules that you can actually test clinically in an experiment. This is probably a few hundreds or a few thousands. And then the topic of this 10 to the 60. So there is this computational funnel that you need somehow to narrow down to detect the promising candidates. And this can be done by virtual screening. And this virtual screening can be done by machine learning techniques. So graph neural networks are obviously one of these components. You can use graph neural networks to predict properties of these molecules. So one of the, the key papers in this domain was from uh, DeepMind by, by Justin Gilmer. Uh, the, actually, the paper that gave rise to the, the message passing uh, neural networks to, to this term. And uh, they predicted uh, properties of molecules as well as uh, DFT methods, discrete uh, functional uh, uh, theory, which is, uh, let's say, a, a cheaper version of doing uh, 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 simulations for molecules, but about four to five orders of magnitude faster. And that was uh, in 2017, I think. Nowadays, you can do way better. So uh, this is one side. Another side is basically thinking of biological systems. So if you think of our body, basically we have a lot of biomolecules. The key biomolecule is protein. We have about 20,000 different proteins that are encoded in our genes. Our genes, basically, they, they, the four nucleotides that form about 2 billion letters in our genetic code, uh, they encode uh, amino acids that then form uh, chains that then fold into proteins. And uh, these proteins, uh, basically, they are, uh, it's not a metaphor to say that they are molecules of life. Basically, they are everywhere, from metabolic processes, from carrying, uh, carrying oxygen, from, uh, 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 from signaling uh, different hormones in our body, from defense against pathogens, uh, antibodies, uh, uh, the structure of our skin, collagen. It's all proteins. We, we are currently not aware of any life form that is not based on proteins. Now, when we... Uh, inject a drug against some, some disease, uh, it is usually designed to bind to, to a protein or multiple proteins to disrupt certain biological pathway. So basically, that's uh, when, when you're sick, one of these uh, interactions between the proteins uh, goes, uh, goes wrong, and then, then the, the drug uh, is aimed to fix it, either enabling or disabling some of these interactions. So predicting how a molecule will interact with proteins is... Uh, of crucial importance. Now you can do it to develop new drugs, and this is one of the exciting collaborations I have with the, the lab of uh, Bruno Correa from from EPFL in Lausanne. Basically, they are uh, uh, biologists. They design proteins, for example, proteins that bind to, to cancer targets. Uh, in in cancer, if you know uh, 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 one of the, the uh, one of the, the currently promising uh, therapies is what is called immunotherapy. It was given the Nobel Prize uh, in medicine two years ago. Uh, basically, it, uh, it is a way of uh, uh, re-enabling the immune system to kill uh, malignant uh, cells that are uh, uh, that, that are normally killed by our immune system. What happens is that some cancers develop proteins that signal to the immune to, to the to the immune system cells to the T cells that uh, these are healthy uh, cells, and that's why uh, the tumor uh, multiplies and grows, and, and the person becomes sick and eventually dies. Uh, so immunotherapy, uh, basically, the, the, the key problem is designing a binder that will uh, will bind to one of these proteins and will uh, basically will disable this mechanism. And one of these uh, uh, potential binders can be a protein on its own. So what we are trying to do, we're trying to build proteins that will bind to these targets. And we use geometric deep learning for these purposes. And now, uh, cancer is just one example. Think of the, the, the current plight that, that is... Uh, ravaging through, through the, the, the entire humankind, the novel coronavirus, right? So you can also design uh, uh, potential therapies or maybe a way to block this uh, virus by binding to, uh, to the viral proteins or spike proteins on the coronavirus. 
uh, some of the, the promising candidates. Now, this is about uh, designing new drugs. Uh, one of the cheaper alternatives to designing new drugs is what's called drug repositioning or drug repurposing. You can take an existing drug and try to find new uses for it. So the drug is already approved by FDA, so you know that it's not toxic, that it's safe. You just find it uh, in your application for it. And the particularly interesting way is to combine multiple drugs. So in some cases, the effect is nonlinear. If you take two or three drugs at the same time, uh, uh, they might suddenly produce a significantly stronger effect. So there has been work uh, also from the from the group of Leskowitz uh, by Marinka Zitnik, who is now a faculty member at uh, the Broad Institute between Harvard and MIT. So they use uh, graph neural networks to predict side effects of this uh, polypharmacy of basically using multiple drugs. Now they are trying to use uh, similar, uh, uh, similar uh, um, uh, models to predict synergies between drugs. I myself, I am involved uh, in a project that, that I'm doing with colleagues uh, from the Faculty of Medicine at Imperial College, Kirill Veselkov and, and collaborators. We are trying to, to, to find uh, synergetic uh, uh, combinations of drugs against uh, COVID-19. So that, that's, also, uh, 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 that's also something that we are uh, using uh, craft neural networks for. Interesting, interesting stuff. It sounds like the graphs can be applied at uh, several different levels in you know this general space of um, uh, healthcare and disease, you know, modeling the kind of underlying biological systems as graphs, under modeling the drugs as graphs, and uh, potentially modeling the diseases as, as graphs. And um, you know, each of these has their own potential, you know, upsides. You've illustrated a few of those. Yeah, that's correct. I think that these are some of the more exciting future applications where uh, craft neural networks can can shine. Awesome, awesome. Well, Michael, thanks so much for taking the time to uh, catch us up on your work. Um, this has been quite a deep dive into uh, graphical neural networks, and um, it's been wonderful to catch up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you.